Let, let me state this on my behalf and that of the court. My, my, my sisters and brothers sitting over this case. As you said, the learned attorney, I was quite clear, or at least I thought I was. The last time we sat here, uh, uh, I spoke in no uncertain terms on how we will conduct the models operandi, how we will conduct ourselves. The matter you've uh, brought before us today, you fear it is a scheme to bias this court or to intimidate or blackmail this court by the vilification of a number of justices of this court, including the Chief Justice. I just want to say this. The lordships, as is provided for in the Constitution, took an oath to protect the Constitution. In the oath, We all took oath, and I'll read it out verbatim. Each one, each one of us said, I will well and truly exercise the judicial functions entrusted to me and will do right to all manner of people in accordance with the Constitution of the Republic of Uganda as by law established and in accordance with the laws and usage of the Republic of Uganda, without fear, favor, affection, or ill will. Guided by these principles, guiding contained in the oath we took, when we become judges, one, a matter which circulates outside of court, we do not attach any importance to it. As you rightly say, if anybody has a grievance, if anybody has any issue to raise with any of the judges here, this is the forum. They come before us, present their case, and we attend to it. Without fear, without favor, without affection or ill will. Let me also say this. Fortunately, I know the Chief Justice of Uganda very well. I think I've known him since childhood. If anyone thinks he can intimidate, he can blackmail, he can induce with favors that Chief Justice of Uganda, then he's heading for a crash against a huge rock. Because one of the things the Lord God denied him is fear. Once he has conviction that what he's doing is right, and if it is a judicial function, he's doing it in accordance with his understanding of the law as he has applied to the evidence, you may have to make a discovery that the person you think you know, you do not. So, speaking for the Chief Justice, whom I know very well, <coughs> Council, rest assured that whatever is circulating outside there will have no bearing in how this court will determine the matter before us.
As a matter of fact, this application came after the alleged utterances. Then that is evidence that what was being said there was idle talk. It was meant for whatever reason, but I consider it idle talk. Because if somebody truly has no confidence in me, he will not come before me seeking remedies. The first thing he would have done was to come to me and say, I want to proceed with my case, but I want you out. I want Judge A out, Judge B also out. This has not happened, meaning that was just idle talk, whatever the purpose was, assuming it was done. So I give you the assurance we will proceed with this application, we will proceed with the petition, and nobody should have the fear that we will favor any person or we bear ill will against any person. We will act according to the dictates of our oath. And for me, the only thing I fear is my conscience. If I go home and I don't sleep after hearing a case, then something is wrong. I wake up and rethink. But when I make a decision and I go and sleep until morning, then I know I am at peace with my conscience. That's, that's what matters. Not what you think of me, but what my belief is. We are not opposed to fair criticism. I said this before. And the positions we hold, we expect criticism. But criticize my conduct, criticize my decision, tear it to pieces, but why attack my person? When you know I do not have the opportunity to stand up there and respond to you. First of all, it is cowardly. Because, you know, I, I do not have the opportunity to stand up there and respond to you. Indeed, if the learned attorney general had not raised it, we would have kept quiet. But I thank you that you did. It's given me the opportunity to let everybody, all and sundry, know. That you can choose to vilify us a thousand times. But when you come before us, that one will ignore. If you have a good case, I will decide in your favor. That notwithstanding. Because that is the oath I took. That is the oath all judicial officers took. That whatever you do to me, when you come before me and you have a case, I will operate from a much higher moral ground than you. And that's how we intend to proceed today, tomorrow, until the task before us is done with. And since you've raised it, uh, we, we all saw this. I mean, we'll be pretending to say we have not read this. If indeed the, pet the petitioner chooses to take another path, we have no powers as court to stop. We never invited anybody to come to court. If you have a plan B, you don't even need our permission. You pursue your plan B, for us we'll be done with whatever is before us. But as I said, we'll show the difference between judicial function and political function. It will not get into our head. As I said, the Chief Justice, whom I know very well, will not be moved by those things. He will decide, together with his sisters and brothers on this panel, the matters before us in accordance with our judicial oath and conscience. I suppose we can proceed now. And let me be on record stating that with respect to recusal, which I have had the learned Attorney General talk about, I have no instructions of any kind, whether specific, general, 
or otherwise. I want to reaffirm my knowledge and support of, of for Article 128, as has been read out by the Attorney General. It is the cornerstone of our practice as lawyers to accord the necessary respect to courts. Otherwise, there will be chaos. Three, my lords, and I wish to complain now that my land friend, the Attorney General, who is the head of the bar, has not, until this morning when I went out of my way to greet him, raised this issue, which would give me ample opportunity to interrogate the same and probably seek instructions, if any. I agree that a matter in court should be in the exclusive hands and four corners of court and nowhere else. And that has been my practice for the last 18 years. The Attorney General has equally not availed me with an opportunity to look at the material that he was able to look at. But my undertaking from the bar, my lord, is as follows. One, immediately after these proceedings, to have an engagement with the applicant and know the circumstances and context with the applicant, my lord, that's my client, to know the circumstances and context in which he said those words if he did. My second undertaking is to undertake a duty. Councilor Beba, yes, my lord. You are the lead counsel for the petition. Have you had, uh, is this the first time you're hearing about what the learned attorney general is speaking about? No, my first you, was- you, you didn't know about it until when he raised it? Until I saw an affidavit yesterday, shown by the Honorable Stephen Tashobia, mm. that he was talking about words similar So you. Those. In other words, you were the only person in Jerusalem who didn't know about these things. No, my lord, I don't know about much about Jerusalem. I would be pleased to. But the point I'm making, I received this affidavit of Honorable Stephen Tashobia yesterday evening as I was mm. leaving office. Okay. I went with it and read through the affidavit. And unfortunately, it did not trigger my action of calling the applicant. Fine, fine. Yeah, pro proceed, 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 proceed. Mm -hmm. That said, my lord, like I did say, I would definitely take up this matter with or without instruction of this honorable court, now that it has been raised by somebody senior, and I take it as a serious matter. Um, the prayer, my lord, raised by the Attorney General, I am not averse to further guidance and direction of this Honourable Court, with, with or without them, I, uh, I have and undertake a duty mm. of a professional advocate. I thank, thank you, Your Lordship. Okay.